Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the third lecture of this uh, for this semester. Uh, may I remind you, the session and the following discussion are being recorded, um, and they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Um, it is my absolute honor to present Professor Micah de Jung from Utrecht University. Micah de Jung, as you probably know, is Professor Emerita for Medieval History and a specialist of the political and religious history of the early Middle Ages. Professor de Jung's prolific and innovative research focuses on monastic life, biblical commentary, penance, historiography, and political discourse in the Carolingian period. Her research has immensely illuminated and shaped the modern understanding of the Carolingian period and early medieval society in the West. Among many awards and honors, Professor de Jung has been awarded fellowships from the Institute for, for Advanced Study at Princeton, the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study and Trinity College, Cambridge. She is a founding member and co-editor of the research network, Texts and Identities in the Early, medieval, in the early Middle Ages, sorry. She directed the theme group Carolingian Identity at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study and was a principal investigator at the Hero Project of Cultural Memory and Resources of the Past, 400 to 1000. Professor de Jung's numerous publications include, among many, many others, um, the seminal in Samuel's Image, Child Oblation in the Early Medieval West, The Penitential State, Authority and Atonement in the Age of Louis the Pious, and recently, as you know, Epitaph for an Era, Politics and Rhetoric in the Carolingian World, and the translation for the funeral oration of Wallaw Corby, Confronting Crisis in, um, in the Carolingian Empire, uh, together with Justin Lake. Today, Professor de Jung will talk about Epitaph for an Era, Three Years Later, Audiences and Allegiances Revisited. As usual, we'll take questions after the lecture, and so if you wish to do so, just to write your name to me or in the chat. And now, without further ado, Professor de Jung, the floor is yours. Thank you. The, the, am I, am I, um, no, I'm not new to that. No. You hear no. me? Okay, yes. good. Um, what we need is the top. Yeah, that's it. Thank yes. you. Yeah, right. Many thanks. I'm, I'm really grateful for the invitation to present my, my work in this early medieval forum. It's become one of the best seminars I know, and I'm, I'll try to live up to, to its high standards. And it also enables me to call attention to the second of the two books you see here on the screen, which is a joint venture of Justin Lake and myself. When our annotated translation of the Epitaphia Marceni appeared with Manchester UP uh, in May 2020, alongside the paperback of my 2019 COP monograph, shown here on the left. The party we had planned at the Leeds IMC could, alas, not go ahead. Uh, in fact, you know, our lockdown in the Netherlands began in the second week of March to 20, just days after Justin and I had sent the corrected third proofs or something like that to, off to uh, MUP. Now, to be honest, during the pandemic, I read modern history and very modern history and preparing for this paper, I had to re familiarize myself with my own research. Oh, really? Did I write on this? Hmm. Now, as I hoped with some distance, I am discovering new aspects I did not quite see before. And as I announced in my brief summary to, to, to this uh, presentation, I, I wanted to take another look at the political context of the text that ha has fascinated me for quite a long time. So when I when I wrote Epitaph for the Era, you know, which must have been mostly 15, 16, 17, 2000, yeah, you know, um, I I pushed back against the generally accepted notion that the author uh, Pascasius Albertus was was a committed partisan of the Emperor Louis uh, Lothar the First, you know, the rebellious eldest son of Louis the Pious, but perhaps I pushed too hard. 
And I also was quite scared of, you know, this kind of cherry picking, selecting bits and pieces of the text and then connect them with highly specific political contexts as had been done rather a lot. So certainly I was ultra cautious about pinpointing any of the Carolingian courts after 843 as the intended audience of the very polemical book, the second book of the Epitaphi Marceni, or pinpointing any clerical milieu for that matter. You, know, you can stick anything onto the Ebo clerics if you, you know. Anyway, today I'll try to push this a bit further, but I warn you, it won't get very far. Now, before getting to this point, um, I'll have to give you some basic background information on Pascasius Albertus and his Epitaphium Arseni, which we, um, Justin Lake and I, have translated as his funeral oration for Vala. Now, I cannot expect the audience today to have read what I wrote and to I'd like to take things from there, but that's impossible. So my apologies to those who did read it. And then secondly, after a more general introduction, I'd like to tell you a bit about the genesis and purpose of these two books, the monograph and the translation. Um, I think throughout my life as a historian, Translating Latin texts uh, ha has been my way into any research project, but I've actually never dared to devote an entire book to one particular text. And uh, at some point I decided I was now old enough to just do this. And uh, the nice thing is that, you know, it, the, my, I had this very idiosyncratic composition uh, of Pascasius Albertus to grapple with, you know, a monk and a one-time abbot of Corby. And I've added, you know, a bit of historiography here and biblio, and, you know, I'm going to say that how much I profited from Henri Pelletier's book of 1938 and Lorenz Weinrich, Voila, etc. I'm going to skip that. I think, you know, having looked at your at the list of people here, you know that. Um, but still, a short introduction to the Epitaphium Arseni and its author. And let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, which is a map of uh, uh, a map with Corby at, uh, at the very center. You see it here, here's Corby. Um, and made by, by Erik uh, Goosman, by the way. Um, Corby is in the Diocese of Amiens. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes of Amiens. If you think of yes of Amiens, that's right. One of Lothar's chums. And here we also have the three main protagonists of this presentation with their death years, which are certain in the case of Adelhard and Wala, but not at all um, in the case of, of uh, Radbert, as I call him, uh, by his birth name from now on, Pascasius was his monastic and his literary name. Arsenius was the by name of Wala, who was one of the main actors, agents in the two rebellions against Louis the Pious, especially in the first one, which was in the spring of um, 830. By then, Vala had been abbot of Corby for about four years. Um, in 826, he had succeeded his elder brother, Adelhard. Um, in this very important function, you know, being an abbot, of, of a, a royal monastery, a royal foundation dating back to the 7th century was, you know, like, you know, being uh, one of the top people. 
And this was something that the monks of Corby were very well aware of and very proud of. And Rothbard himself was no exception. And he also stressed repeatedly that Adelhard, Vala, and their siblings were of royal blood. Um, indeed, these were Charlemagne's cousins. They shared a grandfather. If you move on to the next slide, uh, Shachar, um, then you see uh, uh, the um, genealogy also uh, made for you know, our translation by Eric Hoosman. Um, the grandfather was Charles Martel, and through their father, Bernard, here he is, um, Adelhard and uh, Vala, yeah, um, yeah, were actually, you know, and, and their siblings were, you know, related to the ruling section of uh, the Carolingians, which was over there. Um, both Adelheid and Vala had been prominent members of Charlemagne's ruling elite. Adelheid, you know, as, as abbot of Corby, Vala initially as a count and a general and a good one. But when Louis de Pais succeeded in 814, they both left the political arena, possibly as Gentile Nelson has suggested, you know, as competing Carolingians. Adelheid went into exile. Vala retired to Corby, was tonsured, and became the community's informal leader. Whether he actually became a monk, I don't know. To have your political opponents tonsured and retired to a monastery was not necessarily a definitive measure. It meant that they were put on hold, as it were, and might still be useful in the future. And this held true for these two powerful brothers. Uh, there was a reconciliation with Louis in, already in 821, followed by a public ceremony, a quite famous one in Attingi in 822, where the emperor performed a penance for the sins he committed against his kinsmen, amongst others, these two. An imperial gesture, which made some compare Louis to Theodosius, but not so Robert, who devoted a very venomous passage to this so-called penance in his Vita Adelhardi. Now Adelhard returned to Kirby and with Vala together, he founded Kirby's Saxon daughter monastery, Corvai. And Vala became a prominent figure at Louis's court and the second in command of Louis's eldest son, Lothar, in the kingdom of Italy. Adelhard's death in 826 um, uh, meant that his brother, actually, Vala, succeeded as abbot of the two monasteries, both Corby and Corvai, which was a mighty monastic bastion indeed. Now, I will not uh, go into the history, history of the rebellions of 830 and 833 in any detail, but all I want to stress here briefly is that Vala had a prominent part in the first revolt, but much less so in the second. And that Vala was definitely the Emperor Lothar's man in both cases. In 829, Lothar had been supplanted as the top dog at Louis's court. He was second after the ruler only and a co-emperor himself. He was supplanted by Bernard of Septimania, a military hero who was also Louis's godson. Now this deep offense goes a long way to explaining the first rebellion and its unresolved issues created a fertile ground for the second revolt. With other loyal men in the late summer of 834, when, 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 when the, the big revolt was over, Vala followed Lothar to Italy. And there he became abbot of Bobbio. With many of Lothar's loyal men, he succumbed to an epidemic in the summer of 836. Not so Lothar, 
who lived until 29 September 855. Now, as I said, there's no doubt that Vala was Lothar's man, but as we shall see, this is less certain in the case of his devoted pupil and sidekick, Rothbard. I just give the barest outlines of his life and work. Perhaps he was born in 719, perhaps he died in 860. He was probably an orphan who spent his childhood in the nunnery of Notre Dame of Soissons, where Theodrada, Vala's sister, became abbess in 810. Now, well before Theodrada took charge of Notre Dame, I think Robert had already become a monk of Corby under Albert Adelhard. This was a protege that was kept in the family. Uh, and you can do, <laughs> you can speculate, you know, who, who, who the hell was his father? We don't know. He became one of the foremost theologians of his time, prolific biblical commentator who also dedicated several treatises suitable for women to his mothers in Soissons. He retained close ties to the nunnery all his life. To Adelhard and Bala, he referred as his fathers. And of each of these major figures in his life, he wrote what is usually known as a biography or sometimes hagiography. But what in both cases, I think, is a commemoration and a defense, which is shaped into, you know, by the genre of the epitaph, the epitaphium. Both are a funeral oration. Rappers' commemoration and defense of Adelhard is known as the Vita Adelhardi. Um, and that's what it's called in its oldest ninth century manuscript. But it, it was, it was still an epitaph and identified as such by its author in the text. It was composed shortly after Adelhard's death in 826. Now the Epitaphium Arseni on Wala, also an original title, consists of two books, like its main model, Bishop Ambrose of Milan's funeral oration for his brother, Satyrus. I've agonized a lot about the dating of the two books of the Epitaphium, but I still stick to my conclusions published in Epitaphium era three years ago, whereas the first book was written not long after Vala's death in 836, when Louis the Pious was still alive, I think. The second was added about 20 years later in the mid 850s. And rather than rewriting his first book, um, he may have done a bit of this, but mainly Rothbard used this more subdued earlier part as a foil for his fierce and polemical second book. It is here in the second book that we find Rothbard's version of the history of the rebellions against Louis. And the first book, by contrast, features Vala as the perfect monk and abbot, and as the joint founder of Corvai with Adelhard, and it ends with Vala's exploits in Italy as Lothar's deputy in the mid-820s. Now, by itself, the first book may well have served as a way to cleanse not just Vala's tainted reputation, but also that of Rappert, who had been so closely associated with this great, but quite controversial man. And Rappert only became abbot of Corby somewhere in the winter of 843-844. And by then, in my view, he had been abbot in waiting for almost a decade. Vala died in 836. Um, to add insult to injury, um, Rappert only managed to hang on to his abbacy for, I think, about seven years, give or take, 
for some time between 849 and 853, he had to relinquish this high office. He had to step down. Being an abbot of Corby was a ministry which took him to the highest echelons of power with all the political risks involved. And it's difficult to pinpoint the conflict that made Radbert retire first to nearby Saint Riquet and leaving his abbacy to his dearest Odo, his pupil of all people, the later Bishop of Beauvais. Radbert then settled down at his writing desks, desk like other prominent abbots who had become political hot potatoes. Rabban Moore was another case in point. You know, he, they retired, quote unquote, um, but were in fact pushed out. Uh, Rappert was extremely productive. Not only did he write eight out of 12 books of his commentary on Matthew, but he also added, I think at that particular time, the second book of his epitaph for Vara. And now that he was no longer an aspiring abbot, he could speak his mind in the best tradition of the ancients and the, their tradition of frank speech. And can I have slide four, please, which shows two books that I profited a lot from, um, Matthew Kempschel's Rhetoric and Writing of History uh, appeared in 2011, Irene uh, van Lenswaard's book uh, a few months after mine, but we worked closely together, and from her I learned a, a, a lot about the rhetoric of free speech and how um, this added to my understanding of, uh, of the epitaphium. Now, the gist of this later edition, the second book, is as follows. If we had all listened to Vala and recognized his moral superiority, we would not have been in the mess we are in now. I can't say it plainer than this. The question remains still for me, I don't know whether the second book was the swan song of an old and disappointed man or another attempt to intervene in contemporary controversies by projecting them onto the still very living memory of Vala, or both at the same time, of course. But this emphatic hindsight of the second book gave me the idea for um, my title of, for the book, Epitaph for an Era. And I can assure you that the market division of COP didn't like it at all. So in my contract, it says religion and politics as the main title. Now, isn't that stupid? But I was sure that I could just leave it like that and then uh, it would be forgotten in due course, which has happened, by the way, with the penitential state, which in the contract was uh, called, surprise, surprise, um, penance and power. Okay, um, now some background to the writing of the two books, um, the monograph and the uh, and, and the translation. Can I have the slide five, please? Yes. Okay, in the penitential state, which appeared in 2009, I explored what you might call the, the textual fallout of the two rebellions against Louis the Pious. And you know, once the proofs and the index were done, I embarked on the working translation of the Epitaphi Marseini. I, I, frankly, I just needed something I could easily take up and leave again in between teaching, admin, and writing shorter articles. A bit like knitting or embroidery, some, some skills I, I never ever mastered myself. And I had a, also had a feeling that I had not really scratched the surface of this intriguing text yet. The Latin was difficult, to say the least. It had confounded someone like Alan Cabanis in his widely used translation, English translation called Charlemagne's Cousin, which has the epitaphium and the Vita Adelhardi. And the Vita Adelhardi is actually 
is quite a good translation, but the uh, Epitaphia Marceni, that, that I thought I need to get you know, closer to, to this kind of Latin. At the same time, um, the, the, the Epitaphium was a text that carried an awful lot of historiographical weight. For not only did it inform the, the concept of the loyal palace rebellion, the Loyale Palast Rebellion huh, of 830, which actually dominated German historiography well into the second millennium, but it was also the key witness to the notion of a decline of the Carolingians after the second revolt of 833. And Courtney Booker in his past convictions also uh, published in 2009, actually focuses on this aspect and analyzes this. Well, whatever the case, it was worth digging deeper. And then so with David Gans's Corby in the Carolingian Renaissance on my desk. <laughs> also, Peter Moos, his massive work on Consolatio, um, as many volumes as I could abduct from the library, I dived into the Latin of Pascasius, Radbertus's Epitaphium. And next slide, please. I found a copy of uh, Dümmler's 1900 edition. This is actually still the best edition available. Uh, this copy, which I got for eight euros on, from internet, you know, a printed copy, is very much coffee stained, as you can see. Um, but this was the text I lived with, and of course, also the manuscript, about which more later. What do we have here? Again, you know, this amazing hindsight in the second book, Vala being presented as a latter-day Jeremiah, but of course also this held true for Radbert. And how actually was one to distinguish between the intertwined lives of the author and his subject? Um, Radbert's chosen vehicle for this funeral oration in praise of Vala, a vituperation of his enemy, enemies, was a confabulation between three monks of Corby, of which he, Pascasius, was the narrator. Throughout this text, this author presented himself as an actor in his own narrative, first as Adelheid's and Vala's right-hand man, yeah. Arsenius and me, that was basically the tenor. And then in the second book, as the witness in and participant in um, the rebellions of the 830s. It's no wonder that the generations of historians fell for Radbert's lively description of the two revolts against Louis, which is in fact a very powerful narrative delivered by this Pascasius to his fellow monks and interlocutors. And frankly, what I had to work hardest on for this book, for you know, um, the book on just one text, was its literary aspects. You know, I, things like ep, ep, what is an epitaph? What is a dialogue? What actually <laughs> is, is rhetoric? Could I have slide seven, please? Um, which is, you know, just a very short, um, yeah, the, 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 this was, I mean, it's, I, I know there are things like, you know, the, uh, not, like narratology and, um, I, and I read Mika Ball in the mid eighties, but this, this was what I found really difficult to come to terms with. Well, how, how does this work in the text? Okay. Um, and my idea from the beginning was that liter and it still is, that literary and political history had to be investigated together as interdependent ways of understanding this composition. And it's easier said than done. And what came out of it 
was a short 250-page book, which focused actually quite radically, I think, on the author and the text, and much less so on Vala and his exploits. So next slide, please, number eight. Um, yeah, this is, this is very roughly the structure of the book. Um, history, rhetoric, politics, and but in the, it's the central part that 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 is, I think, the most important. Yeah. Okay. Now I want. Uh, still, I, I I really worried about how could I ever, you know, get my my working translation, which. Uh, was that of a historian, not a Latinist, and that of a native Dutch speaker, not a native English speaker, but into English. How can I actually publish this? And the solution to my problem proved to be, next slide please, Justin Lake from yeah, uh, Texas A&M University. Now, I just pulled this off Justin's um, uh, university website. So uh, we, we are actually only met in our entire lives for one hour, which was during the uh, Leeds um, IMC. Was it 2016 or 15? I think it was 16. Anyway, we got along and we actually spent hours and hours and hours together, with, but it was entirely via the email and Dropbox. And that's how we translated the entire caboodle and wrote entirely together again, the introduction. Right, now onwards to the question of audiences. And I'd like to tackle that um, in the beginning via the manuscript. I'd like to show some images of the only extant manuscript of the text. Yes, there's only one. Um, it was not just Dümmler's edition I lived with for almost 10 years, but also the PDF of the Bibliothèque Nationale 13909. Next slide, please. Here we, oh, uh, no, the next one. Yeah, um, here we have, oh, I'm missing one. Never mind. Um, I'll, I'll improvise a bit. This is, this is actually um, the, the manuscript. Uh, no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll, get, we'll get there. Um, this is a, a bit of a scruffy um, uh, uh, thing of the, uh, you know, a photograph of the PDF of the first two pages. But let me tell you what it is. It is a small book of 111 folia which only contains this particular text. It is damaged towards the end and some pages are missing, but not many. Um, at least three scribes were involved. It was carefully produced as you will see in other photographs and corrected in a distinctive Corby script that emerged very shortly after 850. It may well still have been copied uh, during Rutbert's lifetime. And I like the idea you know, I, uh, that the author himself may have supervised uh, the corrections or may have made some of his own corrections, but I have no way to make sure. Now this one manuscript um, remained in Corby until it ended up first in Saint Arnaud de Crépy in the 13th century, and then in Saint Germain in the 18th century. And that's how it landed in the Bibliothèque Nationale, of course. Now slide um, 11, if okay, try and give it a try. Yeah, the next slide. Yeah, now there you get a, a better um, uh, image of the first uh, folio verso. Um, and the, the other one gives you an idea of the two facing pages. Um, please note that here you see um, the title is there, yes. 
but not the name of the author that's been added in a later script. So we have, in fact, an anonymous text, but with the title Epitaphium Arsenii. Um, if you look at the next slide, which is the facing page, yeah, um, folio to recto, you see that a later hand here has actually completed the, that P into Pascasius, but not the A here, which stands for Adeodatus, an unknown monk of Corby. In other words, throughout this manuscript, in the original copy, I mean, in, the, in this copy, there was, there were no names, there were just initials of the interlocutors. So we have Pascasius, the narrator, we have Adeodatus, an unknown monk of Corby, who is in the first book, a young guy who asks you know, innocent questions. In the second book, he's, you know, he's older and wiser. And then there is the S, which is Severus, a grumpy and outspoken character. And in that case, we know that it's Robert's old friend, Odelman. And by the time the second book was added, Odelman had died and he was replaced by the equally outspoken Theophrastus. Now, also a monk, a figure we don't know, but his role in the confabulation is the same as Severus. He takes over as the Frank speaker. Now, the other two in the second book are older, wiser, sadder. And the prologue of the second book emphasizes that much turbulent time had passed since that first book was written, unrelenting pressures on all fronts. And it refers obliquely to Rutbert having relinquished his duties as an abbot. Yet, if we look at the next slide, this gap, ah, um, this was the one. I, this is this is my my, my model, not uh, not Shachai's. Here we have, you see, um, the, the David Gans's kind of you know assessment of what what this is like. This um, uh, little book uh, prepared to higher standards, you know, angels in red and green. And you can see, yeah, you know, the scruffy first pages are not re representative. It's actually very, very nicely produced. And here you get an idea of um, of the script. Next one, of which I last don't have a nice, yeah, here. Here you get the transition from uh, the, the first book to the second. And well, um, you, you can actually uh, see that, that, yeah, the same hand continues the text and it's the same choir as well. So in other words, whatever arguments I have for dating the two books as 20 years apart are entirely text internal. Um, can can you go back again to the to the thing with David's uh, yeah uh, you know uh, back 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 yeah just one yeah um, as you know the this one excellent manuscript and the lack lack of later impact of the text has actually led some people uh, and learned ones at that to the conclusion that the Epitaphia Marseini was a private work written at best for the monks of Corby, and perhaps as an, you know, only as an exercise uh, or in soul searching by, by Rutbert, you know, Rutbert talking to himself. Now I disagree. And if you look at this, this manuscript, um, as you know, Rosalind McKittrick yesterday when she went over my text said, look, uh, this is, this is a very carefully prepared little book. It looks like a presentation copy or you know, something made for preservation in the library. It's not the author's autograph. Even if the corrections might be, it's not the author's autograph. This is a really nice project. I thought when I heard Rosman's comments for one of the many able young paleographers we now have around. Um, you know, have a look at the corrections. You know, what hand are they in? 
But I also disagree with this notion of private, a private text on text internal grounds. These the issues that are addressed already in the first book, but also in the second are those that actually concern the leadership of an increasingly divided Carolingian world and empire. It's, it's a joint responsibility for Commonwealth, for, for the public domain, for, for Respublica, with at its very heart, Fides. Huh? Um, and Fides is not just, you know, kind of, you know, uh, the, the loyalty of vassals. It's a wide ranging array of civic virtues. Um, And um, well, I could go on into uh, issues about Fides, you know, is it loyalty to one's ruler? Is it loyalty to God? No, I won't. What I want to get across now, once more, is that this was a personal text, which is not the same as private. And it was destined for a limited audience of knowledgeable insiders. So that's where you, get the famous pseudonyms for the you know, um, political protagonists in the second book, um, which are not meant to hide identities, but to reveal the moral connotations of these people to those who are in the know. Could you go two slides down? Uh, yeah, one more. Yeah, that's it. Now here they are, you know, you know uh, all that, um, you know, Justina, um, uh, Justinian, Honorius, Melanius. If anyone knows who Melanius is, I, 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 I will actually send you uh, some bottles of very good wine. Um, but this is this is um, you know a, a very disparate array of names. I mean, Justina obviously was Ambrosius's. Um, great adversary um, and, and, a, and an extremely nasty woman in, in uh, uh, Rothbard's book. But Lothar as Honorius, that is a name that depends on Arsenius. Arsenius is Vala. Huh? Arsenius was in the, you know, at least, you know, in, in, in the tradition of the time, Arsenius was uh, the tutor of Theodosius's son Honorius. So there are um, really um, uh, connections here that are extremely different. And the alias, uh, the aliases chosen are meaningful, but not self-evident. And it is completely dependent on the text in question. I mean, not Arsenius. Arsenius was actually called Arsenius by the monks of Corby, we know that, but we don't know whether Lothar was ever called Honorius outside of this text. At least I haven't been able to find it. Um, you're missing somebody if all is well. Yeah, haven't you missed Charles the Bold? No, he is lacking and he is only referred to in the text in the second book as Rex the king, and he's, that is not with any friendly inflections. Um, now, the two keys to this loosely, this loosely constructed world of Ambrose, as I said, are on the one hand, Justina, Judith, she is the evil doer par excellence, and on the other hand, there's Honorius. Now, and for the rest of my time, um, I want today, I want to concentrate on Radbert's relation with Honorius Lothar. And it is stressed by um, the very, this allegiance, allegiance of Vala huh, is stressed by the very cho choice of Honorius as um, alias and the other way around. Now, so let there be no doubt about Vala. But what about, as, as Honorius' as man, but what about Radbert's view of Lothar? I think that was more complicated. Um, and 
let's not forget that Vala left his faithful sidekick Rothbard behind in Corby in 834 to cope with the fallout of the rebellions, which included the splitting up of the union of Corby and Corvai that ha happened in the summer of, uh, of 833. And it implied incredibly much loss of valuable monastic property to Corby in Saxony. And Rathbert also had to defend his beloved abbot against internal criticism in Corby, and that much you know, we, we can certainly assume. Vala had left his community in the lurch. He accepted the abbacy of Bobbio from Lothar, and in Corby this clearly rankled. So let's have let's have a look, a closer look at the portrayal of Lothar in the Epitaphium. It's a, it's really a mixed bag. On the one hand, there is the remarkable complaint of the father, Louis, against the three sons on the field of lies prior to the divine judgment, according to Robert, that made Louis's troops defect to the camp of the rebellious sons. In this bit of text, it's actually quite a long bit of text, we, we get Louis's terse accusations answered fully and elaborately by the sons with Honorius or Lothar as their extremely eloquent spokesman, representing the essential values of loyalty, justice, and constancy. You know, here we have got it. You now, Dad, you always taught me what to do. I heard from you what I should do. And now, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm not going to read this out. You can, I'll leave it up there. You know, if you're, if you're bored, you can always, you know, have a look at, at, at uh, Honorius going loose at his father. But you know, this, this is a royal speechifying um, at its very best. And it is Lothar at its, as it, at its very best. Um, and the exchange is presented as a querela. It's a judicial complaint in writing, which is then rebutted point by point. I think that's how you best translate querela. It's called an altercatio, a public debate. But recently, I was struck by its similarity to the public royal speeches, the At Nunciationes, which figure in the written agreements between Louis' son, which are concluded after 843. For example, there's one in Meersen in 847, and there's another one in Meersen in 851. And if you look at the Capitulary text, you, you not just get you know, the, the, the chapters, but you get these adnantiationes of rulers to each other, and it's all very high fluting and very, very splendid. And I think in this case, we have an indication of what royal public speaking may have been like. Now, of course, I don't think this was a verbatim record or you know, neither were the capitularies for what we have in the capitularies is a Latin version meant for a public and much more distant consumption. But what we get in the epitaphium is the inventio in the Ciceronian sense of such a royal speechifying by an author who had ample experience thereof. Rapper had attended plenty of councils and assemblies and synods or whatever you, you know, want to call them and they heard hey, there the king speaking. I'd like to pursue this more, but not today. My point here is that in Rathbert's second book, here is where we encounter Lothar at his very best. But there's also the other Lothar who, having ousted his father, accepted the commands, I cite, of the entire realm the Totius Monarchiam Imperii, taking his father with him on the basis of, quote, some verdict I am not sure of. And Lothar, who then condoned a free-for-all 
which took the form of a greedy grabbing of Honores land offices. And this is the Lothar who had his father con condemned in Compiègne in the autumn of 833 and submit to a public penance. Something that horrified Robert so much that he only alluded to this humiliation in prose very heavily laden by sentences uh, from the book of Job. And this is also, also the Lothar who was as eager as his father for Arsenius' services, but Arsenius said, no, no, you won't have me. Allegedly in 831, the two rulers completed, competed to get the two, the great men on their side and they didn't succeed. Now, this is all highly unlikely, but that's not the point. The worst of all is you know, that Lothar, as well as Louis, ignored Vala's advice. And the Vala was being squeezed out as an advisor. I cite, and so Arsenius had ever less success with his advice from, for the gates of carnal desire had everywhere been open and cupidity had flared up. And that was about the winter of 833-834. Okay, now we need to keep in mind um, that this was Radbert's perspective. Um, what actually happened to Wala at the time it, it may have been something entirely different. Uh, Louis' biographer, the so-called astronomer, puts Wala at the head of a delegation sent by Lothar to his father in May 836 and claimed that Louis and Judith received Wala warmly, eager to forgive him all the many crimes he had committed against them. This indicates that regardless of what Robert said, Wala had not completely disappeared to Italy. He kept in touch with Louis's court in the north. And it also seems there were attempts at rapprochement. And my suspicion is that Robert got caught in the middle. And I won't de deny for one moment that the image of Louis the Pious in the epitaphium is totally unfavorable, but at the same time, Rothbard's proud self-presentation and self-importance as the chap who was sent on imperial business by Louis is also unmistakable. There's nothing black and white about this text. And when the second book was added, Rothbard was not about to paint um, a, a purely pretty picture of 833 and Lothar's role in it. Okay, now um, I, I come to some conclusions. Is that still, um, I think I, I need seven minutes or so. Is that okay? Yep. Um, yeah, well, who would have liked to read a text like the Epitaphium once it was completed, copied, corrected? Um, the, as we've seen, the one excellent copy remained in Corby. And there may have been others, but I suspect, uh, I think it's important to keep that in mind that the recipients were few and carefully chosen. Now, the, the king, uh, Charles the Bold, is an unlikely candidate. He looms nameless over the second book, greedy for the property of the churches, that is the religious communities monastic and otherwise. In the 840s and 50s, Rothbard's criticism of the use of church lands for military purposes was shared by many clerics. But locating this author firmly in one particular political faction is not easy. And I would, st I still think it's not very helpful either. I have, I have learned a lot over the, 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 the past um, weeks from uh, going over uh, carefully uh, over Stuart Early's book, um, next slide please, which appeared in, um, yep, 
there it is, in, into 20, the making and the unmaking of the Carolingians. Paperback in July, the hardback is, is unaffordable, I can tell you, but paperback in July. Um, Early uh, has, has a wonderful post, uh, 843, chapter six, um, we, where he is perfectly on top of all the events and controversies and God knows what, but he does not do early medieval history as party politics. Um, he says this is, was governed by brothers and by one family with competing royals publicly articulating fluctuating Carolingian identity and status. The unmaking of members of this family so they would no longer be viable kings was incredibly difficult. And as Early explains, Charles the Bold tried to do this with Pippin II of Aquitaine um, in the years 850 to 854. That's, you know, that's <laughs> right in the middle of uh, <laughs> when Rothbard, I think, wrote, wrote this text. Um, Pippin II of Aquitaine was the, 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 the son of Louis's son, Pippin of Aquitaine, the flu who died in 838, um, and so he predeceased his father. And it seems that Charles the Bold only succeeded to, to actually eliminate um, um, this son, Pippin II, when Lothar withdrew his support as you know, um, a serious contender for the kingdom of Aquitaine. Now this, this Pippin II was one of the political bombshells that no doubt also affected Corby and its abbot in the, in, in the early 50s. Pippin II was tonsured in, in 852 and relegated to Saint-Médard of Soissons, the very monastery where his grandfather Louis had been uh, submitted to a public penance in 833. Now, even closer to home, Pippin II's younger brother, Charles of Aquitaine, who had earlier sought protection at the court of Lothar I, was in 850 tonsured and dispatched for safekeeping to nowhere else but Corby. Now, presumably, Robert was still in charge when this illustrious guest arrived, but no longer when Charles escaped four years later in 854. Um, yeah, I've, uh, quite, quite some years ago, Ginty Nelson said, why don't you look into these guys? They have to have something to do huh, with, um, with, with Rothbard's um, uh, deposition. And I found it also very difficult to believe that this was not the case, but I've never been able to find a clear connection. And um, the, if you think about you know, when, when, when the second book was added, uh, the two real baddies of, of, of the text, which was you know, Judith, she died in 843, and Bernard, her alleged lover, you know, had been dead since 844 and you know, executed by Charles the Bold. Okay, uh, this may have been Judith, uh, you know, um, um, a decade later, may have been some kind of stick to hit Charles with, but this is less obvious the case with Bernard, you know, as, who, as I said, was executed at Charles the Bold's order. But of course, what about, and now I come to the final bit, uh, what about Rothbard's lasting ties with Lothar the first, who died on 29 September 855, a most pious death for Lothar, who had fallen ill, had months before decided to make, meet his maker in the monastery of Prüm, having taken on the monastic habit. There are interesting connections there, which I might have made more of when I was writing the book. There's an obvious clue towards the end of the Epitaphium second book 
where Rathbert says it was the venerable Queen Ermengarde, the wife of Lothar I, who informed the monk monks of Corby about the details of Vala's death from Italy, and who had taken um, care that the religious communities of Italy, including her own convent, Santa Giulia, Santa Salvatore, San Salvatore in Brescia, actually you know, did the commemoration of Vala. These were, you know, such a con this convent was really a true Carolingian stronghold. Now, right before or after the Treaty of Verdun, we have some evidence of Ermengarde and Charles de Bold exchanging Corby property. So there were connections there. Her interested, interest in Corby is attested before Rothbard finally became abbot. Um, I, I, I would now think that Ermengarde may have been his preferred uh, intermediary to Lothar's court. Uh, and Rappert was not the only one. Um, Rabban Mao's commentary on Esther, the Book of Esther, originally dedicated to the Empress Judith in the early uh, 830s, was rededicated a decade later to Ermengarde, who was now the legitimate empress in the early 840s. So, you get a multi-purpose Old Testament Esther, a model for imperial rule by an empress. I'd like to pursue this a bit more um, some other time, this connection with Ermengarde. She died in 851. Um, who knows, she might have been open to some criticism of her husband, who followed her to the grave four years later. Still, it's worth remembering that the Emperor Lothar himself, in a letter to Pope Leo, the, the fourth, 847, 849, thereabouts, reflected on the past. This time of unhappy discord between us and our father, which at the instigation of the devil and his satellites lasted for some time. Well, you can say that again. It lasted well into the 850s when Rothbard wrote his second book, deeply regretting this time of unhappy discord and as certainly as much as Lothar had done. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I have many questions, <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, opening the floor for our questions. The first question we have is from um, Josh Timmerman. Yes. Am I? Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah okay. You, you probably should unmute yourself, yeah. Josh. Yes. So I, I, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting lecture. Um, I'm especially interested in the late antique typology in the Epitaphia Marcinii, which you recently went a bit further in discussing in your piece um, on uh, talking about the world of Ambrose. Um, what I long wondered, just speculatively, I admit, is if Vala is in places likened to Ambrose and the younger monk figure is named Adiodatus, uh, is Pascasius um, perhaps implicitly cast in a kind of Augustinian role? particularly as the Augustine of the Cacicciacum dialogues. To mm. that end, I wonder, do you know whether Pascasius Redbertus was familiar with the text that came out of Augustine's Cacicciacum period, um, specifically yeah. the Contra Academicos, De Beata Vita, De Ordine, and the Soliloquies? Yeah, I, I, I have the inclination to you know, grab my book and look in the index and look at Adeo Datus. So what the hell did I say about this? I know I, I, I try to figure out the uh, Augustinian connection to, um, you know, I, I thought this must be an Augustinian name, Adeo Datus, mm -hmm. right? But um, I, and I, I think, I thought, yes, this could be true, but I, I, I could never really, um, I don't think I ever proved it or something, I, that, that he actually read that text. 
Um, no, you know, that's really a, a bit of a problem. I, I, I wrote, I wrote about this four or five years ago, and I thought, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there was, you know, this stuff with Adio Datas. I'll look it up for you. Do, do you know by chance if any of these Kasekiakum texts were available in the Corby Library at this time? Well, you know, my my. Uh, uh, Possibly, um, I probably check David Gans. Uh -huh. Right. You know that's that that would be the first uh, the first uh, road mm -hmm. to travel, and, and you know the, the Augustinian connection with you know the, the of the name is clear, but it's mm -hmm. also a general child of Blake's name, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it. Uh, I th I I think it's really difficult to. Um, you know, in the case of Odelman, yes, we know, and in the case of Pascasius, yes, we know, but the others, um, the, it, yeah, is it there is typology, yeah, and and uh, it may be both Augustine and 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 the child of Blake. Thank I'm you. sorry, I probably should, uh, yeah, I should make a note and uh, go back to the research I once did and uh, get in touch with you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take the I'll take my uh, privilege and ask one of my many questions, um, specifically about you. Uh, you mentioned that you you uh, believe Roberto's plan to write the two books from the get go, um, but that um, his the fact that he was no longer abbot of Colby enabled him to be more free. Let's say um with his words so mm -hmm. do, do you think that his plan with with the second book he had a different plan for the second book and then once he was he was expelled from Corby, he 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 changed his plan for the second book or how do you how do you see it yeah well that that that, that that's a, a, a crucial question look i think the book the thing was planned as a two book thing i mean because its model is um uh, is Ambrose's uh, funeral oration for, for Satiris, which is a two book affair. And if you look at the two, um, the two books and the citations of Ambrose, you see that quite deliberately, it, Robert's first book, you know, re refers cites Ambrose's first book and the second book, yeah. So that, there's, a, there's a plan there. Um, um, whether he will, he he actually could be more outspoken because he was no longer uh, an abbot. Um, so you know, how much does it have to do with his his kind of you know personal uh, place in the world? Yes, a bit because as an abbot, you know, you're a public figure more than if you're not an abbot. You know, that's quite clear. Uh, on the other hand, um, I don't. When 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 he wrote the Vita uh, Adel Hardy, he wasn't exactly mincing his words either. You know that that passage about a twenty two is pretty nasty, and it, it, he just says, you know, everybody was blind until Adelard came along, and you know, and 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 here you got this 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 emperor who does a penance, and he didn't know what he was doing. Yeah, you know? um, and you know. You can say, okay, he could write this because he was, you know, uh, under the protection of you know, no longer Adelhard, but Bala. Huh? But I think it's 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 better to you know follow Irene uh, van Lenswoude in this respect and to say, okay, this is a kind of um, you know frank speech that people will recognize as such. Um, uh, and, uh, speaking, you know, uh, truth to power, that's probably, you know, speaking truth to power. Uh, if you do it the right way, it's acceptable to the powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember that, that silly Dutch guy in, in Davos a couple of years ago, you know, who sat there, you know, saying everybody's wonderful and everybody's good. And, uh, you know, all the people in Davos, in that, you know, that, that, that strange kind of, you know, business people stuff um, they have there, you know, they were all, oh, wonderful. You know, he is this, he is this innocent who, 
yeah, this outsider who tells us like what things are like. Now, what Irene has really, I think, shed wonderful light on is you know, how people can maneuver themselves as authors in the position of outsiders. Uh, as you know, um, and and do the most daring things, and then be acceptable. Can you follow that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, it, it, it's 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 a, a worth reading her book. You you get a, you get a, an idea also of and if people have the idea that this is also not just you know uh, a practical tradition but also that a literary tradition. Yeah. I really have the feeling that that this is also that but Robert in the second book by being so very outspoken made an appeal to his to chums you know people who could understand what he was doing and yeah, then yeah. it wasn't it wasn't just you know uh, offending kings sure but I, I do wonder especially in light of what you said in the end if he was uh, of course, writing such a book wouldn't, it's not a matter of uh, one month or two, I think. No. Um, but the fact that he was maybe pushed out of Corby by certain people, I mean, may have made his tone, at least to, to, to some degree, a bit more. Oh, absolutely. No, a... absolutely. Um, um, uh, but I find it, <laughs> this is a clever guy. I mean, he, he, he really... Uh, sets us up you know you start that second book and he says oh my god you know everything is collapsed and you know uh, and now we're in a co completely different world and I've often sat there and I said is you know <laughs> is he actually fooling me or is is he is he telling you know something of the truth is this really 20 years later and is is it written from a completely different position and I, in the end, I came round to the the latter viewpoint. But sometimes I still think, well, you know, he's he's very clever. He, he might have just had me on. And uh, thank you. I mean, I, I might as well ask another question. Um, I, I'm very curious as to what you think was um, the way Radbertus, um Perceived the, the the relationship between Vala and um, and Lothar, considering their Iliad, considering the fact that so maybe he saw him as a, a teacher for Lothar or something like that. But the, the fact of the matter is that, um, or if we that, that um, Vala followed Lothar to Italy. Well, I think that Vala was Lothar's teacher and, and, and leader. And that's why he was called Arsenius. The, 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 in already in 831, in a letter you know, by a follow which monk of Corby, I mean, he is called Arsenius. Um, so the Arsenius image, you know, was Vala. And then the next thing you get is that Lothar is called Honorius. Uh, um, and we don't know whether that was also a nickname, but it was, you know. But what, what I'm trying to say is Bala and, and, and Lothar, yes, together. But what Pascasius actually says um, yeah, is, is, look, uh, <laughs> Lothar messed it up in the end. Um, he 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 actually made, yeah um, he, he should have actually taken Vala's uh, advice uh, in eight thirty three. You know they should have done this together. They didn't. Um, so, but I think this may be him projecting a completely other you know other later situations on Lothar. You really have to. Um, you, you can't just, um, how to say this, I mean, uh, that, that's part of the problem with, with uh, Weinreich's biography of Vala. It is so much based entirely on the uh, Epitaphi Marseni. Yeah, that you, you have a problem, you know, who is who in this case. And my idea is that, that uh, Robert was something of go between between the, you know, Lothar there, you know, in the south. Um, 
I'm not sure whether Wala ever returned to, to Corby. Uh, there's no evidence of that, but, you know, Robert makes it out as if this never happened. Was this true? I mean, there's a problem there. There's a real problem between between Robert and Wala <laughs> as well. Exactly. And, That's the reason why I'm asking, because it, yeah. it seems that, you know, they're not the same person, even if we connect Robert. No, and absolutely Wala. not. No, 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 they're not the same person. Um, but but how to pick them apart is, 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 is it takes takes a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is there um, in the first um, the the folio where we see the beginning of the first um, yeah. the second book? Sorry, there's yeah. is the first name there is scraped. There's something that's it looks like it. I don't know. At least from the from the picture that we saw in the um, in there the are erasures. erasures. Yes. Yeah. Is, yeah. it, is that a name? I wasn't really able to see to see very well from uh, from here, but no, I, um, we can't tell. No, well, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we, we, we there, there are um, you know Dümler in his um, in his uh, edition has made some uh, you know some guesses. You know, so they, they might have been this one was there, or it might have been that one. So I'd have to look this one one up. But yes, there are now and then there, and yeah, and really interesting erasures where you think, hey, what's going on here precisely? Um, so. And and um, and and the the, the the notes in the side, you know, the notes are really really uh, interesting as well. To, and I'd love, you know, somebody to take this up and see whether you know the, the annotation in the margins, um, the corrections uh, have been done by the same hand. I I mean I'm not I'm not good enough a paleographer for that. Somebody needs to do this. Anna Do Feva or something. Somebody like that who really, you know, knows knows her way around stuff like this. Who knows? Yeah. Well, that is a very, uh, very good note to finish. Um, if uh, no one wishes to ask another question, um, please join me in uh, thanking Professor De Jong again. Um, thank you very much. And uh, next, our next session um, will be the last lecture for the semester. Uh, will be on June fifteenth with uh, Jonathan Conant from Brown University. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Well,